Ever thought what it would be like to own a dragon? Well, our protagonist Ryuji knows exactly how it feels too, but let's just say that it ain't your ordinary dragon. Yuji wakes up in cold sweat from a dream of a very bright light with eyes saying his name. Perhaps he was seeing the light? Okay, but in all seriousness, it's a mystery girl as they always do with these shows. That one mystery girl who shows up in the protagonist's dream. Anyways, he gets up and gets his breakfast and is about to head off to summer school. I kind of feel bad for Ryuji Kaz who actually enjoys summer school, am I right? As he heads to school on the commute, he sees some kids playing a dragon game, obviously foreshadowing what's about to come as even the name of the anime suggested. He makes it to the classroom where we find a girl who's smitten for him, her name being Misaki. Ryuji being the typical romance trope protagonist has absolutely no clue about this, although any idiot can see it. Anyway, school is going on when suddenly a woman wearing sunglasses just busts into the classroom. She walks over to Ryuji and tells him that he's coming with her. She ends a notice for early departure from school and get this, she signed the form with a kiss. Now that's badass. We find out that this big melon and waifu who I would call mommy is actually Ryuji's cousin's sister, Eriko. At least that's what Misaki tells her friend. She explains how she had gone to America for her further studies. Meanwhile, Eriko is driving Ryuji somewhere on her van. She tells him that she had just arrived today and that she needs a hand on getting some luggage. Now I don't know what kind of luggage she's talking about but I can tell she ain't up to any good. She tells Ryuji to open up her laptop where he finds a website called The Seven Tales, which is an organization that recovers lost preciouses, the treasures of the world. She asks him to enter his name there and that's when a geeky message pops up saying work well for your boss. He tells her that he is surprised that she got accepted by the society which I am guessing is like the mother organization of all these organizations looking for lost preciouses. They park the van headed to what seems to be a dock. She explains that if they find a S tire lost precious they can get enlisted on the society and that a group called Fang are exchanging a lost precious on that dock today. Their plan is to steal it from them. They wait till nightfall to initiate their plan and surprisingly Ryuji is on board with it after she tells him about how it could be her family's lost precious. As they wait for the transaction to take place, Ryuji is worried about the fact that Fang uses many underhanded methods when dealing with lost precious. She tells him that he needn't worry and that she got an ace up her sleeve. She pulls up a magical cane from God knows where and she explains how it can make people see miracles and that it has powers. Ryuji thinks it wouldn't be wise to use a lost precious on people, but she reassures him saying that it's not a cursed precious so they will be fine. She asks him whether he's still hung up on what had happened three years ago and bingo that's the reason why he was so down. She tells him that it doesn't bother her anymore and that's when the Fang Gang arrives. Haha <laughs> that rhymes? Fang Gang? Anyways let us not get sidetracked. They arrive and proceed with the transaction when Eriko unleashes an attack from the cane she had told Ryuji about earlier. She summons a swarm of butterflies which leaves all the members of the gang knocked out and she fetches Ryuji to collect the goods. He picks it up and hauls it onto the back of the van as they make a getaway. Of course the bad guys don't just give up they pursue them and Eriko tries to fight back but it's not good enough. The briefcase is about to fall off and a shot of a bullet opens it up revealing the girl Ryuji had seen in his dream. As bullets get fired at them, the girl, yes the mystery girl, sends a blast of fire that destroys the whole set of pursuers. After this, she faints and falls onto Ryuji's lap. Misaki is standing in front of Ryuji's apartment as he had left his bag at school earlier that day and she had come to give it to him. Now we all know she didn't just come there for the sole purpose of returning his bag of course. She hides from his view as she sees them coming towards the apartment. She sees that Ryuji is carrying a girl on his back. At the apartment, Eriko has no idea of who she is but thinks Ryuji does as she had said her name. She notices there's a weird looking necklace around her neck and realizes it could be one of the lost treasures. She tries to take the necklace off which wakes the unconscious girl up and ends up in her biting her. But she stops when she sees Ryuji and goes up to him and hugs him. They soon figure out the only word she knows is Ryuji as she clings onto Ryuji the whole time. She tries it again to get the necklace around her neck, but she resists so they decide that Ryuji will be the one looking after her for the night. Eriko then sends Ryuji out to the grocery store so he can get some stuff to make them dinner and also get the mystery girl some clothes. As he comes back home with the groceries, she meets Misaki at his doorstep and she tells him how he had left his bag at school and that she was just returning it to him. That's when Eriko suddenly calls and asks him to come upstairs soon. As he heads into the apartment, he finds that the girl had gone into a rampage since the moment he had left to get groceries and everything is messed up. Eriko reveals that she had found out about the identity of the girl and that she was in fact a red dragon, a mythical creature. She apparently figured this out from the mark that was in her hand. Ryuji prepares dinner for them and realizes that the girl is like a toddler and he ends up feeding her. 
Meanwhile, Eriko explains that the girl will grow to a full-size dragon when she gets older and they can sell some parts of her. I know that sounds messed up, but they are talking about stuff like dragon scales, so don't worry. They decide to name her Rose as the marking on her hand is similar to a rose. They decide not to tell Ryuji's parents about her as they are probably out looking for some other lost precious. While Rose is watching TV, she finds Eriko helping herself to some ice cream, and this prompts her to train her in the same way we would train our dogs. Anyways, the next day, Ryuji wakes up to find Rose is next to him and gets jump scared. They are surprised to find that Rose can talk now as she is excited for breakfast. They are finally about to peacefully have their breakfast when a helicopter pulls up near their helicopter, with a scientist looking guy asking whether there's any dragons with them. Oh, good news, there seems to be a big bad in the story as we get a glimpse of a very emo looking dude going after the target, obviously being Rose. He tells the driver to never call her a target again, and that if he does, he would kill him as she is his fiance. Ryuji and the gang get on the chopper and the scientist tells them about he had been sent by the society and that it was his first time seeing a dragon. He checks her out, well not the usual way, but in a scientific way as he checks the mark on her arm. They make it to a very secret looking base where apparently Ryuji had been before. He tells Eriko that he had already been there once for the breaker inspection and that he's a level 10 breaker. The scientist identifies him as the child of the Kisaragi couple who seem to be popular around the community. They take Rose to a lab where the doc does some tests to distinguish her differences from a human, but he barely finds any. It's revealed the professor's name is Tokura. While Tokura-san is doing his tests, Ryuji asks him about what he had said earlier, which was that it was his first time seeing a dragon. He explains that almost all the information they know about dragons comes from a diary from 10 years earlier, and in that it explains that in a certain place in Europe, the man had found a giant egg from which a girl had hatched out. He explains that with age, Rose will grow on to be a fully-sized dragon, and that she might already have some wings on her back. Everyone is curious to find out, but they all realize only Ryuji can do it, so he checks her back out. God, this sounds wrong. Anyways, as Ryuji is touching her back, he gets the memories from the time his parents had taken him to Europe, and he had seen Rose hatching out of the egg. This is further confirmed by Rose saying she had hatched in order to meet Ryuji. He hypotheses that this clingy behavior that Rose has towards Ryuji is cause she has imprinted. Totally a Twilight reference, but moving on, things are about to get dark as behind the lab, there's a guy loading up a gun to take down Rose. Meanwhile, Tokura and Eriko are trying to decide on what they will be doing with Rose, and Takura says that he needs to conduct some more tests on her, and that if Ryuji is around with her, it would be better. Back at school, Mistaki is worried about losing Ryuji as he had seen him carrying Rose to his place the night before. Her friends tease her that Ryuji hasn't come to school as he's probably out with her, and this makes her wonder about who this girl is. As they think of what they are gonna do with Rose, they are intruded by the Fang Gang as they destroy everything in their path with their abilities, and get to the inside of the compound where he finds Rose. The guy introduces himself as Onyx and he identifies as a black dragon. He tells them that he's here to get his fiancé that being Rose and that the necklace she's wearing is proof of their engagement. As he swats away Ryuji, Eriko sees that he's wearing her family's lost precious and tries to get it but gets sedated by Onyx. He's about to finish off Ryuji when Rose steps in the way and stops him. She complies to go with him as she wanted to protect Ryuji from further harm. They head back to what seems to be the dude's evil lair which doesn't look very evil. There she asks him whether he is the person who had kidnapped her, and he explains that he was the person who had taken her captive when she left the cave without any defenses and that she should be grateful to him as she's still alive. She asks him what he wants from her and he tells her that he needs her to marry him as he wants to engage her. He explains that engaging is a ceremony in which a dragon awakens her true power, and that for that they would have to marry. She asks him as to why he needs to be stronger when he's already so strong, and that's when he reveals that he wants to find all the lost preciouses. Meanwhile, back at the lab, Ryuji has almost given up on trying to save Rose as he seems to be in a state of depression over what had happened. After Eriko convincing him, however, he decides that he has to do something to save her and gets ready to go on a rescue mission. He remembers about the time where he almost died when he had found Rose's egg but got saved by her and decides that he has to repay the favor by saving her as well. As they are about to suit up, they go over to a storage facility which contains all the S-tier lost preciouses that have been found. Ryuji seems nervous and it is revealed that he was possessed by a cursed item three years back. Eriko guides him over to a compartment containing Slash Breath which was entrusted to him by his parents. The item called Slash Breath was a dagger made from dragon scales. He soon figures out how to use it as he obliterates the other compartments in the room. Back at Onyx at base, Rose is about to head off to go back where Yuji, she is stopped by Onyx who convinces her that the humans are bad and that they don't care about her. She breaks down after hearing Onyx's story, 
and that's when they get the sudden announcement that a helicopter is heading the way of the base. The helicopter carries Ryuji, Eriko, and Taruka alongside a team of what seems to be a special task force. As they approach the tower, they find that there's an invisible force field blocking them from entering the work of a dragon. Ryuji steps up and takes it upon himself to destroy the force field as he takes the slash breath and slashes the shield open. They get in the building where they are ambushed by guards, but the gang manages to make themselves out of this situation and head to the elevator. Eriko explains that according to her understanding, the reason why Rose is so clingy towards Ryuji is cause she had fallen in love with the young Ryuji who she had seen when she first hatched. Anyways, he walks into a room where Rose is about to get married to Onyx. Ryuji tells him to let go of Rose, but Onyx had brainwashed Rose to think humans are bad and she starts telling them that she hates humans as they don't treat dragons well. That's when Ryuji tells her that he likes her, which makes her instantly change her mood and come over to Ryuji, who is covered by Rose, who had just unleashed her wings. Onyx is enraged as he fights with them and tells that she is still bound to him by the pack that's placed on her in the form of a necklace. Ryuji uses his dagger to destroy it, and this pisses off Onyx, who starts barraging him with attacks. That's when Ryuji and Rose tag team with each other and combine their powers to overpower Onyx, who takes his final form as a huge black dragon. But guess what Ryuji and Rose engage which grants him a power-up which allows him to defeat the dragon and save the day. But it came with a cost as Ryuji is hurt bad. That's when Rose kisses him and heals him up. I guess a dragon's kiss can heal a person. As they head away from the wreckage of the building, Rose is worried that Onyx will come after Ryuji. He tells her that he will be stronger for her, as he wants to stay with her. It had been a week since the Tokyo Tower collapsed. As of this week, Ryuji has plans with his best friend to go on a once-in-a-lifetime five-star hotel experience. As Rose is informed about Ryuji's plans this weekend, she starts to have a breakdown. Her wings burst out of her back along with a gust of wind whirling around the living room. Eriko volunteers to settle this situation. She takes her to a corner and whispers to Rose's ear, supposedly a secret Eriko said, which leaves Ryuji in confusion. Ryuji and his best friend head towards the beach the next day. As they gaze at the white beach, they come to find an awkward Misaki and her friend. Misaki, who is covered in a blanket, is shy to talk to Ryuji. As Ryuji runs off towards the white beach, she follows Ryuji as she is informed by her friend that it could be an opportunity to connect with Ryuji. As she gets closer to Ryuji, he starts to make eye contact with her. He starts walking towards her. Misaki, seeing this opportunity, leans towards a kiss. As she brings her arms together, Ryuji runs past her to see that Rose and Eriko are in the beach. Leaving Misaki in an awkward position, Ryuji gets worried that Rose's dragon symbol might be seen and informs about this matter to Eriko. She replies saying that Tokura-san has applied a special ointment called artificial skin, and therefore her symbol cannot be seen through the naked eye. Later that day, Ryuji and the others head on over to the hotel. As Ryuji walks past the hotel lobby, he is interrupted by the hotel receptionist as she hands over a letter to him. As he takes a closer look at the letter, he sees a red wax stamp with a dragon symbol. Ryuji, Rose, and Eriko head on over to the coordinates of the given letter as they find a mysterious figure standing at a rock. The mysterious figure reveals that she was the one who sent the letter to Ryuji. She introduces herself as the Marguerite of White Dragons and shall be addressed as Maruga. She reveals that the reasoning of sending a letter was to ask for a favor. Maruga wanted them to recover the White Dragon's heirloom sword that was once taken by the humans, as it is now being treated as a lost precious known as the Ice Rage. She states that the heirloom is owned by a level 10 breaker, George Evans, also known as Bloody George, and is staying by the church nearby. Why did Maruva ask them to recover the sword? You might ask. It is because Ryuji is the 8 level 10 in the world, meaning he can understand dragons very well. Eriko asks Maruga on what would they get in return for recovering the sword. She replied by saying that they will get rewarded, and if the task had not been fulfilled, George Evans would be informed of all the information she knows about Rose, Eriko, and Ryuji as in the form of a threat. Shortly after Maruva implied a threat on them, she proceeded to her hotel room. And prior to last night's incident, Ryuji goes around the town to find info on George Evans. He buys a bottle of soda along the way as it was a sunny day. Thereafter, he proceeded to ask the shop owner of the church nearby. She replied by saying that there had been quite a lot of trouble in the town since the arrival of a tall man in the nearby church. After a few hours had passed, Ryuji goes back to the hotel room to discuss the above situation with Eriko. Eriko suggests that, that instead of him coming to attack us, that Ryuji should go to him and hands over the slash breath over to Ryuji. This leads Ryuji to question Eriko whether he had known that George Evans had arrived to Japan since she seemed prepared for this certain conflict. She replied by saying that she had only heard suspicious rumors and she did not think that he would actually arrive to Japan. 
Anyways, the next day, Ryuji goes to the church in search of the icebreaker. As he proceeds to open the door, he notices a tall shadow falls upon him. As he takes a look behind, he sees a tall man that looks like a Walmart Dio from JoJo's giving him a villainous look. He introduced himself as George Evans and proceeds to question the frightened Ryuji. Ryuji is at a loss for words as he does not know what to say. As he replies by saying that he wanted to take a look at the church, the once villainous looking tall man became an optimistic man baby. The cheerful smile that he gave left Ryuji startled. He insisted on giving him a full tour. As George was explaining Ryuji on the architecture of the church, he noticed that the sword was placed at the center of the church behind the preacher's podium. It was extraordinarily big. As he noticed the sword, Ryuji began to feel the power of the sword. As he got closer and closer to the sword, he was pushed back from some sort of force field. George, on seeing the above scene, figured that Ryuji might be a breaker as well. He proceeded to question him. Are you a breaker? Do you belong in the society? Ryuji replied by saying that he is just a rookie and could barely use his powers. George sympathized him by saying that he was just like him when he was a kid, as he was useless to a lot of people back then. How did you resolve yourself? asked Ryuji. He replied by saying that he realized that he wasn't mature enough and later on he discovered the path he should take. Shortly after these words were said, he grabs the sword and starts to recite the story of who once wielded this sword. He points the sword at a direction as he recites the story about the hero that came out of nowhere. A century ago, there was a village that is attacked by a dragon and that it was razed to the ground. At that time, there was a hero. A hero that once risked his life to defeat the dragon after which he disappeared. The villagers revered the sword he left behind as the legendary sword. As he concluded reciting the story, he added that the path he decided on was after he received the sword, and that it is his responsibility to kill any dragon that might harm this town as he saw them as incarnations of evil. A few moments later, a cheerful rose comes hopping towards the church. Ryuji took immediate action by covering her dragon's symbol as George was right in front of them. Rose greeted George with a brightening smile. So did George. While George went to the back of the church, we find that Ryuji and Rose are about to escape. Rose denies as George had promised her an ice cream, but he tries to tell her how if he knew she was a dragon that he would kill her. While they were discussing this regard, the goons from earlier come over to the church looking for Rose, who had managed to burn the leader's hair. They threaten Ryuji and Rose when George arrives and stops them in their track by using his sword. In the aftermath, however, both Ryuji and Rose flee the scene and meet up with the snow dragon, Maruga. She explains to them how the sword that George has is actually her family heirloom and that she needs help in getting it back. That's when Ryuji's friends come, and they suggest that Maruga join them in the festival the same night. It's made everyone is at the festival. While the gang played a few games, we find George who arrives late and sees Maruga, immediately falling in love at first sight. If only he knew she was a dragon. After the festival, Maruga, Ryuji, and Rose head up to a moonlit staircase where Maruga tells him about the tale of the time when a dragon fell in love with a girl. The girl who had fallen in love had been killed by the people as they thought she was conspiring with the evil, and because of this incident, dragons and humans never fell in love after that. Although I have a gut feeling that will soon change as George makes it up the path to find Maruga, who he immediately asks out. As of the love confession that George Evans made the previous day, Eriko gathers Maruga, Ryuji, and Rose to discuss about a strategy to recover the sword. She suggested that Maruga should accept his gesture and should go out with George Evans as it is a perfect opportunity for them to recover the sword. At first, Maruga looked in deceit as she was worried that George might find out she's a dragon. But soon after, she realized that this job required a couple of risks. Therefore, she agreed to go out with George until the sword was recovered. Soon after the strategic meeting was concluded, their plan was in action as they head to the beach to meet up with George, so that George and Maruga, so that they could continue with their date. As they arrived on the beach, they waited till the arrival of George Evans. During the wait, Ryuji takes out a slip of paper, a paper that was written by Misaki's friend reminding him to hand over the prize that he won for Misaki at the fair to her personally. As we see exhausted Ryuji, he is interrupted by the arrival of George Evans. As he announced his arrival to the whole beach, he gets flabbergasted noticing Maruga next to Eriko. His excitement goes through the roof as he runs off to get a swimming float since Maruga can't swim. As George torpedoes off to get a swimming float, Maruga informs Eriko that she is ashamed of wearing a swimsuit in the beach. Eriko reminds her that retrieving the heirloom comes with a price to pay even for her. As she is reminded of that, she takes off her gown, revealing a seductive swimsuit on her gown. As George arrives to the shore, he's astonished to see Maruga with her swimsuit. They go off the shore for some bonding, I guess. They head towards the far end of the shore. As they enter the water, Ryuji informs Eriko if Maruga is going to be alright. 
She replied saying that everything is going according to plan as she starts to count down from 1 to 3. As she counts to 1, Maruba's swimsuit starts to dissolve. She starts to scream as she runs towards shore. And oh yeah, and she accidentally trips and falls on Ryuji, leaving him in shock. Maruga is enraged as she questioned Eriko for the reasoning of the melted swimsuit. She replied saying that to deceive foes, that she must first deceive her friends. As Maruga pleaded that she wanted to leave, but yet again she was reminded what was at stake here, and that he had to keep George busy till they retrieved the heirloom. After Eriko informed Maruga these details, she proceeded towards her vehicle along with Rose and Ryuji to commence the next step off her plan to retrieve the heirloom from the church. As Ryuji and Eriko got into the car, they were ready to head over to the church. As they were about to go, Rose refused to go to the church in which Eriko had no problem with as she proceeded to drive to the church. As Rose looks at the car driving away. After the events at the church, George thanks Ryuji for his effort in saving the church and leaves. After he leaves, Ryuji asks Maruga about the sword being a cursed precious. She explains that the sword is imbued with a malice from her late uncle who went berserk and had to be stopped by her father. In order to beat him, her father had taken a human form, and that's what led to the tale they know now. After Ryuji tells her plan to Rose about how he is going to retrieve the sword, she gets enraged and ends up leaving as she believes George is a good person and can be convinced. Soon they follow Rose who had made her way to the church in semi-dragon form, revealing herself to George. He takes her to the church and tells her that dragons are born sinners and should be dealt with. Although George is a morally good person, the malice of the sword is affecting him. That's when Maruga arrives and reveals her real name Maragorite, the princess of the white dragons. She explains that the man George respects so much is her father and that she apologizes. It's too late as George was affected by the swords Malik starts attacking them. After struggling for a while, Ryuji realizes the only way to beat him is by engaging with Rose and the two of them engage. After this, he beats George and cleanses his mind as he thanks them for saving him. The next day, Marguerite thanks Ryuji with a kiss for his bravery, which totally gets on Rose's nerves as she insists that Ryuji and her should get married. Misaki, meanwhile, is absolutely flabbergasted. It's a new day and the society is having a gathering of breakers, well, basically a party. As Ryuji is headed to the party, he notices a girl trying to save a cat who has got stuck on a tree. As she tries to save the cat, she falls and Ryuji tries to help but soon realizes she doesn't need it as she uses his head as a landing pad. He finally makes it to the party where Eriko shows that there are many collectors there who collect A-grade lost preciouses. Eriko meets a man who is a bit too interested in her lost precious, the earrings, and he tells her that she will contact her if he finds the other earring as the earring is pretty much useless without having the pair. They have a bit of chit-chat around the party with people when Ryuji notices the girl from earlier. He goes over to talk but she seems very introverted and to his surprise disappears like Batman when the lights go off. As the lights come back up, the girl has transformed into a wolf or whatever this is, and starts snatching everyone's lost preciouses. The security arrives and she is almost caught, but Ryuji helps her escape. After the events, Ryuji and Eriko gives their statements and come back home. At home, Ryuji asks her about what the earring does and she explains that it helps her hear the truth or whenever the person is feeling from the heart. She explains that only a female wielder can use it. They go to sleep only to wake up and find that the wolf girl from earlier is back and she's trying to steal the earring. Eriko makes quick work to catch her by using a trap, but catches Ryuji as well in the process. This leads to awkward tension as the both of them are tangled together, leading Rose to boil. After they tie her up, Eriko tries to interrogate the girl by tickling. She spills to them that her name is A.I., and that she was sent by her master to get the earring. They do a bit more interrogating, but Ryuji gets wet by a chemical, and they both have to shower. After a very steamy scene, we make it back to the bed where A.I. is talking about how she doesn't trust them and trust only her master. Ryuji tells her that her master is just using her, but she refuses to accept and after a bit more of pestering followed by Ryuji, trying to offer her food the doormo rings. It's the man who Eriko had met earlier at the party, and he tells her that he found the other earring and that it's in the box he had just brought. Surprisingly though, the box opens up and delivers a dose of sleeping powder as it is revealed A.I.'s master is this man, Fumari. He puts Ryuji to sleep with the sleeping powder as well and tells that they will be coming with him. Fomori takes them to a huge facility and while on their way back, A.I. remembers what Ryuji said about how her master was using her. This was all proved right as A.I. later onwards puts on the earrings and hears his thoughts which are completely different to what he was saying to her. After this, she questions him only to find that Ryuji was right all along and that she was not adopted but rather kidnapped by her so-called master. She escapes and helps Ryuji untie himself. She begins to question everyone's sincerity, but when she hears nothing straying from Ryuji's thoughts, she tries to help him escape. 
Meanwhile, Eriko and Rose are rushing to the place where Ryuji is being held at. En route to their escape, they come across Fumori who reveals that he is a Yakuza member. My bad, I meant a breaker. He explains that he gains his powers by absorbing lost preciouses, and that he has absorbed around five of them to this point. Now for a big plot twist, it is revealed that AI isn't a wolf by birth, but that she was merely infused with a cursed precious granting her the abilities of a wolf. As the fight progresses against Fumari, who is every Spider-Man villain as one person, things go downhill for Ryuji and the Dragon Gang. That's when he goes to his last resort and engages with Rose, but this time isn't enough and Fumari is only stopped by Rose's new ability which is revealed to allow her to take away power from her foes quite useful in this scenario. Throughout the fight, it's revealed the motive of Fumari was to get revenge on the society and that by absorbing AI, he could be a being of even higher power. As he loses, he has his moment of repenting as they always do in anime when the villain loses. After the fight, it is revealed that A, Ai's father is still living and that she has family. After seeing her off, Ryuji confesses that he wants to enlist in the society as a level 10 breaker as he wants to put his powers to good use. It's school time and to Ryuji's surprise, Rose is also attending school with him. On their way, Eriko hands Ryuji his level 10 breaker assessment as he has passed it and tells him that the test might happen anytime and that he should be ready. At school after the introduction of Rose to the class, Misaki is left in dismay as her best friend thinks fast and starts hatching a plan to retrieve Ryuji. All of a sudden, the class is raided by a pink-haired woman who fires a bazooka at Ryuji, which he manages to guide out of the class and put a stop to. The lady introduces herself as Bianca and she tells him that she's here to get data on Ryuji for the breaker application. As they start the data analysis, the first thing Ryuji got to do is strip as he is to be measured all around. Luckily, his friend comes to the rescue and helps measuring him up. After that, Ryuji put through various tasks to determine his P and LP, meaning the physical condition and L the ability to control the lost preciouses. She tells him his L is somewhat low as it is only 123, but that changes during a fight. To test his maximum output, they bring on a training bot from the society called the Neo Golem, who soon loses control and is stopped by Ryuji doing his usual engaging with Rose. As the L is recorded from the fight, Bianca concludes that he has the highest L anyone ever had in history. As the fight ends, a black draped woman looks over them and leaves a trail of mystery as she walks away silently. After bidding his farewell to Bianca, Ryuji is given a birthday present by Misaki as it is his birthday. Unfortunately, though the data her friend had gathered from the device Bianca held was entered wrong, and she ends up freaking Ryuji out with a frog-themed present. Way to go, Wingman! It's morning and Ryuji wakes up to find that a lost precious has been addressed to him. They are about to open the wrapping when AI and Misaki both arrive with homemade cookies. After a bit of a chit-chatter, the gang opens up the wrapper only to be sucked straight into what seems to be a painting of abandoned town. Well, everyone Ryuji. The girls run around the town trying to find an exit, but they don't make much progress and to top it off is chased by a man carrying an axe hunting them down. Ryuji tries to stop the man by stabbing the painting, quite dumb if you ask me. To his surprise, Bianca has come over and she's here to help. She deduces that it's a curse precious which target only women. Also to note is that the word liar is written everywhere around town. The girls decide they have to make their way underground and that's when they come across a room with a mirror. The mirror questions them each about their most important events and who they would die for. Eriko answers her questions well but Misaki hesitates for a bit ultimately restarting the hunt by the killer. But Misaki telling how she felt allowed for the painting to open and for Ryuji to save them. Once safely out of the painting, Eriko deduces that the painting was done by a man whose girlfriend had betrayed him, therefore his intent had left its mark on the painting. After the events of the painting, the gang goes on a picnic to a lake where they are suddenly attacked by a mysterious dragon who claims to be Omnix's bride. She tells them that her name is Safi, and that she is one of the blue dragons and that she has come to take revenge. Although all she does is miserably fail and retreat back to Omnix's secret lair. Back at the base, Safi gets told to stay back at the base by Onyx's right-hand man. Well, woman and she tells him that it was direct message from Onyx. Meanwhile, Ryuji and Eriko make it to a society gathering as Ryuji wants to get to know what the society's plans are. We find out that Bianca is now the acquaintance of Tokura, and that they are planning on conducting more tests. School has ended and Rose is heading home when he comes face to face with Safi who tries to attack her, but ends up getting her clothes wet. The two of them bond over hot springs and Safi explains to Rose that she has not fully matured yet and that she has to get kissed on her mark to fully transition into an adult. With this knowledge imparted, she leaves and that's when Ryuji arrives. Rose tells Ryuji about the whole story and they end up performing it and in turn making Rose blush up and avoid Ryuji. 
Ryuji is really worried about Rose, but Irio reassures him saying that she's just going through something similar to puberty and that she would be alright. Meanwhile, at Maruga's castle is infiltrated by Onyx, who had access to forbidden books possibly hatching for his big evil plan. Things aren't so grim at Eriko's place as Ryuji and Rose wake up and greet each other while blushing due to the incidents of the night before. God, this sounds wrong. Throughout the next day, the both of them are still awkward with each other, and they both confer their friends on what they should do. Rose literally goes and asks Misaki as she tells her that she only asked her cause she knew what it was like to like Ryuji. Meanwhile, Eriko and Bianca try to understand what exactly is going on with Eriko when Safi suddenly arrives to visit Rose. Eriko takes this chance to capture her and interrogate her, but she tells the same thing which Rose had said earlier about the transition to adulthood. She explains that it increases the affection one has for one another, and that it's similar to ovulation in human females. At school during PE, Rose suddenly collapses. Ryuji knows normal treatments wouldn't work as he calls Eriko. They head to the scientific research facility which Tokura works in and try to analyze what the situation is. Rose's body is heating up to dangerous levels and that's when Safi tells them that it has never happened with her. That's when Onyx's right-hand woman arrives at the scene looking like she came out of the Matrix movies. She tells him that Onyx has a message for him and takes him to the balcony, where she helps them contact through Lost Precious. Onyx explains the reason why Rose is sick is the fact that Ryuji isn't a dragon. But then he explains that the reason why Ryuji is able to control and even engage with Rose is because he is in fact a Lost Precious, one which grants him power over dragons. He further explains that it is the reason why Rose had asked him to not touch her as he instinctively scares dragons. He tells him that if he keeps Rose for longer, she will only get weaker, and that the only way to save her is for him to hand her over to him. After much reluctance, Ryuji agrees as he knows there's no other choice and helps the right-hand woman escape with Rose. The days following this event, Ryuji is in a state of delusion and Misaki, who notices this, talks to him and tells him that he has changed so much during the past few weeks, ever since he had gone out of class with Eriko. She tells him that she's there to listen and he can talk to her if he likes to which he declines, saying he's alright. As Ryuji heads back to his place, he finds Maruga at the doorstep with news. She starts explaining how her and Onyx lived in the same country, and that the knowledge he acquired from the books while true might be altered to make Ryuji feel hopeless. Ryuji wasn't ready to hear it as he walks out, but Maruga follows him and the two of them end up in a conversation after Maruga hurts herself while running after him. She explains that Onyx, as a black dragon, has the instinct of going after the red dragon regardless of the method. She tells him that what Rose is going through might just be a mere change in emotions, and that Ryuji and Rose could be having a proper relationship. She believes that Ryuji might be the exception when it comes to whether dragons and humans can coexist. After hearing this unmotivated, Ryuji sets out on a rescue mission with Eriko and Maruga to retrieve Rose who had lost her memory and is getting along with Onyx just fine. The plane which they plan on escaping is stopped as they are barraged by attacks from both Maruga and the society forces. AI joins the battle midway as she saves one of the captains. Onyx decides he has to take things into his own hands as he tries to resist Ryuji and the others from entering but it is stopped shortly as he makes his way to Rose who takes a minute to remember him. She tells him that she loves him but she doesn't want to be an adult. Ryuji tells her that everyone has to grow up at some point and that Rose has to too. He reassures her by saying that he will grow old with her, as he loves her. The moment is short-lived as Onyx takes full dragon form and tries to destroy the plane, that's when Ryuji's parents make their long-awaited cameo as they blind Onyx for a moment allowing Ryuji and Rose to kiss resulting in a love engage which overpowers Onyx. Even he is surprised by the events that unfolded as he gets thrown away by the power of love. I know that sounds cringe but yes. Man the day on a high note as Ryuji and Rose both lay against each other clearly exhausted. It's a new day at school in Ryuji, the chick magnet is approached by every girl we get to see through the series. Misaki, on the other hand, is about to restart her Retrieve Kizaragi Ryuji campaign with her friend. Love is blooming as Tokura studies about the romance of a man and a dragon, which is new news in town.